Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, F5 Wednesdays. Uh, this is one around APM automation. Today, we've got uh, Jason Wilburn talking, who's one of our APM SME leads for the company. So this is someone that's very, very knowledgeable in APM. He's been doing a lot of work with APM automation and some of the things that you can do around, uh, you know, um, automating different policies and SSLO, and they've got a lab built around that. And he's going to Today's gonna to be a little different format. He's gonna do mostly uh, show you know what he's done and, and a lot less uh, PowerPoint presentation. So Jason, I'll go ahead and leave it for you. Thank you, Brian. All right, so I'm Jason Wilber and I've been with F5 for a little over five years now. Uh, some of you may have already met me over the years. I am the SE, one of the SEs now that covers the system integrator community. I used to be the lone SE that covered everyone and now they've, <laughs> narrowed down my patch a little bit, so I don't cover every system integrator anymore, but I do still cover a number of them. But one of my side hobbies is uh, being, as Ryan mentioned, the APM SME lead for the company. Uh, I tend to spend most of my time in between meetings figuring out different solutions and ways of doing things in APM for customers and other SEs. Uh, one of my big things for the past few months has really been to, to develop a knowledge base around how do we automate access policy manager? Because as a lot of customers move towards AS3 and things like that, I've been trying to showcase, okay, while AS3 will allow you to do APM, autom will allow you to automate uh, LTM and GTM and things like that, there's not really any automation in APM and AS3, right? And I'm gonna show, there's some hooks into it, but fundamentally you still have to build APM policies outside of AS3. And what I want to show you guys is how to do those kinds of things. So first and foremost, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just kind of kick the can down the road and talk a little bit about, well, what is Access Policy Manager? So for, for those of you that have never touched APM, I'm going to kind of show you a little bit about APM and then I'm going to show you, okay, here's how you do those kinds of things through an API call. So first and foremost, what was the previous topics that we had covered in the previous webinars? Uh, Ryan has already posted this into the chat. Uh, you can notice there on the link, if you go to that link, any of the pre recordings from the previous sessions are automatically put up onto that YouTube channel. Ryan, is there anything you want to bring up about the previous recordings or anything like that before we dig in? Oh, yeah, you're actually not sharing out your, uh, or you're not cycling through the presentation. It's not cycling. Yeah. Let me try that again. Let's try that. Is it just me? I don't know. It says sharing is paused. Let me see. Let's try it again. I don't know. I didn't realize it wasn't sharing. Can you see it now? There you go. Okay. Yeah, that's weird. About the previous topics, um, <clears throat> guys, you know, last week was uh, Terraform, Terraform intro. We've got a recording of that. Uh, the week before that was Ansible Tower. And then we had that before that was uh, the cloud architecture intro with AWS. All those recordings are up on the playlist I put in the chat uh, and which is also can be linked. You, know, you can click on this link here. Um, uh, under the LinkedIn, we've got them shared out there. So all the future events are they posted there as well as the recordings. And then the recordings link will take you to the, the YouTube playlist, which is under our F5 Government Solutions YouTube channel. You can get all the other videos associated with F5 you know, Government Solutions. Let's get going. Thanks, Ryan. All right. So what is Access Policy Manager? The way that I like to think about APM is it has anything to do with authentication or authorization controls. Meaning sometimes we're in line and we're providing multi-factor enablement, single sign-on functionality, front-ending VDI technology. But in some cases we're actually out of band and we're not in front of the application. We might be providing some sort of identity service, maybe like an authorization server or as a SAML IDP. So there's multiple places that APM fits inside of an organization, whether it be VDI proxy, be a VPN concentrator, or just sitting in front of an application providing MFA enablement and single sign-on. Ryan, you want to add anything before I transition? 
No, other than just, uh, you know, APM as something that's included. If, if you don't already have it today, you have, you're going to have a best bundle. You've got it. You may have purchased it on the side as another module, but it's also included as uh, something called APM Lite, which is a fully featured 10 user license and every big IP has that. So if you have, if you are not using it today, you want to test it out. Of course, you can ask us for an eVI license. The other option is to, is to enable APM Lite, which is something, like I said, every big IP has today. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to building APM policies, right, the way that we do that traditionally has always been through visual policy editor. And what VPE allows you to do is graphically build the workflow for how somebody is going to authenticate and gain authorization into a resource or some sort of application, right? So as you can see here, this is a pretty common use case in the federal government where we're doing some sort of smart card enablement on the client side and then we're going to convert that to a Kerberos ticket to pass to the backend web application. So the way most folks do this is by going into VPE, they build it, they come up with a blank policy. And the very first things that are in these policies is this start icon here, and it goes directly to a deny icon. And then everywhere along that path that you want to make an authentication or authorization control decision, the way I think about it is like if then statements, if this go do this, if this go do that, right? And what that essentially does is build these branch conditions, right? So in this case, what I do is I prompt for a smart card and say, hey, give me your certificate, right? And then if they give me a valid certificate, then I go down the success branch. Then, then I actually go out, in this case, go out to an OCSP server and then validate that that certificate is good and hasn't actually been revoked, right? And then once it's successfully been authenticated, then I, what I do is I pull the information that I need out of that certificate. So in most cases, especially in the federal government, it's pulling out the UPN. It's pulling out that 10 digit number. And then in the case of DOD, pulling out that 10 digit number and then pulling out at, at mill so that we can find out who that actual user is, right? And obviously this can be customized to your environment. Then, then once I have that person's information, I go query the local directory service and find, does that user actually exist in, in my organization? And then in this case, because I'm working with Kerberos, I actually need to set the local domain for what the AD, for, the AD domain is going to be to where I'm going to go request tickets. And that's what this set variables does. And then I permit, then I permit access. Anywhere along this option here, you can see there's these fallback branches, which basically send them to a deny. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you one, how to build a policy like this through automation. And I'm also gonna show you some other different examples and also to see, see where the repos are, where I'm actually putting these examples so that everybody can get access to them and try to take out some of the heavy lifting for everyone that's trying to build automation around big IP. All right, so let's get into this, right? So if you're not familiar with iControl REST, um, all of the APM APIs look like this. They all go to HTTPS, the, man the, the management IP address of the big IP, MGM, TM, and then slash APM. So all our requests, when we want to build a policy, we're going to hit that endpoint there. And we're going to then go more fine grain and I'm gonna show you the various endpoints, right? Various methods are supporting to create objects, delete objects, to modify objects, all the methods are there. And then one other thing that customers are typically not aware of is that there is actually a table of contents for all of the big IP APIs. All you have to do is go to the big IP management interface, go to MGM slash TOC, and when you access that, it's just going to ask for your username and password, the same username and password that you use to access the management interface to just do typical GUI configuration. And what it's going to do is it's going to give you a listing of every one of the endpoints that are available on that version of code. Obviously, for based off version of code, you're going to get different endpoints, right? And this is important because these are all hyperlinked. You can actually continually just go drill down into this and find information about your big IP. So if you had 
some sort of service that wanted to know if something was built, you could just send a Git request to these various endpoints and find if that object is there or not. All right, so let's get going. So I control was all about an imperative request, meaning I want to build a AD AAA object. I want to build an OCSP server. I want to build um, uh, a Kerberos SSO pop profile, right? Whereas AS3 is all is a, our declarative interface. And today, the way AS3 works is it allows you to build LTM and, and GTM um, configurations holistically, right? I can build the virtual servers, I can build the pools, I can build the SSL profiles, I can build everything about those LTM objects through a single declarative API request. But when it comes to APM, you only have two options today when it comes to building, uh, uh, using APM in those types of declarations. And in, the, and in this case, you can see there's, here are the two examples. One, you can, the, the APM profile needs to exist. And the way that you do that is when you build your AS3 declaration, you add this snippet of code here. And basically what you're saying is, is that this APM policy or profile exists on the big IP and that it's in the common partition and go ahead and attach it to the virtual server that I'm about to build through this AS3 declaration. Now, the way that I'm going to show you how to do this and use this configuration piece here is what we're going to do is we're actually going to build the APM policy through iControl first so that it exists on the box. And then when we go do our AS3 declaration, it's already there. And all we're going to do is post that AS3 declaration and say, hey, use this APM policy that was just built, right? This is one way of doing it. Another way of doing APM policies with AS3 is, whoop, I'm moving my, scroll, my mouse wheel, is by doing an import. So you can actually take an APM policy. Say you don't want to build the whole policy through automation, right? You just, you have a sample policy. It's exactly the way that you want it. And you want to reuse that policy <clears throat> for various applications. What you can do is you can take that policy, build it in the GUI, export that policy, then what you do is you have to unzip it because it's gun zipped and you need to take that tarball. It's the only file in there. You have to take it out of the gun zip and then take that tarball, tar, tarball that is there and then put that somewhere on some web server, right? And in this case, what, I, what I've done is in my environment, I'm just hosting on an internal web server that hosts my various APM configurations and then it's kind of the same process. In my AS3 declaration, what I do is I say, rather than, hey, it exists on the big IP, I say used. And in this case, I say, hey, this is the APM policy that I want to use, right? But that, what that does is it actually sends a reference down to here, to, a, to app1-psp. And what this reference is, is where does this APM policy live, or this profile live? And this profile, since it doesn't live on the big IP, it lives on a web server. And this is the URL for where that policy lives. So this is a way to actually just take existing policies and dump them out and put them on a web server and be able to easily import them and reuse them in that fashion. So, all right, so let's keep going, all right? So this is, you've now got the two ways to automate APM policies from putting them in AS3, right? So let's talk about how to build those policies. To build a policy in APM, it requires a multiple eye control rest calls. And I'm gonna show you a couple of Postman collections after this to, to kind of take this home and give you more context around these, what these boxes mean, right? So to build just a basic blank policy, what you have to do is you have to start a transaction. What a transaction is, is it's it, when you send a request to start a transaction, it gives you back a transaction ID. This transaction ID is essentially a way for me to track all subsequent requests. And then when I'm ready to process the, all of those requests on the big IP side all at one time, 
by committing this transaction. So if I go back and reiterate that, what I mean by that is I start a transaction, I get back a transaction ID, and then all of these subsequent requests that I do all have a header in there that contains my transaction ID. And I'm gonna show you this in the Postman Collections on what I mean by this. And what that allows the big IP to do is now track those transaction requests. And it, what it does is it accepts all of these requests, but it doesn't actually process them. It basically holds all of those requests until I go back and I commit and I say, commit all of these transactions with these transaction IDs. And what that allows it to do is build out the entire policy in one fail swoop. Because what you don't want to do is build a partial policy. You don't want to build branches that don't end in an object, right? And so what we do is we ensure when you're building a policy, you're building all of those pieces rather than something that might be orphaned, right? You might send a branch, you could potentially send it to a branch that doesn't really exist or to an object that doesn't exist. So by putting these things in a transaction, you ensure that everything is there to build that policy. And in fact, when I commit a transaction, if something's missing in here, it's going to come back and yell at you and let you know that, hey, you're missing this object. You need to add it in there. You're missing a reference to something. All right, so that's a transaction. All right, now if I take these pieces here and we dig a little more into this, what a customization group is, is starting, I wanna say around the 14.0 versions of code. We started changing how our logon pages looked, how our web top looked, and we, start, and we started to call that modern, right? And actually, if you go into the GUI and you build an object, if you look ever look at that object, it will say standard next to it, or it will say modern in the GUI. What the customization group does is it allows you to define whether what the look and feel is on the page. Is it the modern look and feel, meaning is it a white background that's center justified, or is it the the older way that is left justified when I'm talking about logon pages and everything's gray. That's what a customization group does, right? And then if you take an agent, what an agent is, is if you were to click in an object in visual policy editor and you click on it and say it's an AD auth object, right? When you click on that, it has various settings in there about cross domain support, about which AD servers do I want to use. It has all of the settings for that AD object in that. That's what an agent is. It's all of the settings that has to do with what you would normally see in visual policy editor regarding that individual object. Right. Then the next thing is, is a policy item. What a policy item is, is it is all the branch rules. So back again to, if you think about visual policy editor, right, and you had a success branch and a fallback branch, what the policy items do is it allows you to link all of the items together. So start branch is going to link to logon page, logon page is going to link to AD auth, AD auth, right, is going to have two branches. It's going to have a success branch and it's going to have a fallback branch by default, right? Success branch is going to link to uh, an allow and, the fallback branch is going to link to a deny. That's what the policy items are, right? So the way that I typically describe this is if you take every object that is in visual policy editor, it takes three requests to build that object because you need to know what branch rules, what the branch rules are. You need to know what the settings are, and then you need to know whether it's modern or standard. You need to define the customization group. And I'm going to show you this and the templates that I have out there on GitHub to where you guys can take a look at this and even play with this in your own environment, right? Now, once you have all of the objects defined or all the policy items defined, what you do is you build the policy. So if you've worked in VPE for years, you think, oh, the policy has all of those branch rules and everything else in it. No, no, it actually doesn't. What a policy has in it is literally all of a listing of all of the policy items that are in that policy. So that's all you're going to see in a policy. And I'm going to show you that too. And then a policy and then a profile is a link to the policy items. 
And it's also all of those settings. So if you were to ever to click on an APM profile and not click on VPE, there's all of those timer settings about how long does a policy, a policy last? How many uh, <coughs> sessions can be open? Those types of settings, right? Even And things like SSO, that's all in the profile. They aren't part of the policy itself. And then, like I mentioned, when we first started going, right? Once you're done with the profile, you commit the transaction and then it builds everything that is in between this transaction. That's how policies are built, right? So before I get into the demo and I start really starting to field questions as we start to go through this, I just want to bring mention that there is going to be a survey at the end of this uh, webinar. So uh, please fill it out to give, if you want to see more content or you have ideas or feedback, please fill out the survey so that we can uh, give you better information and things in future webinars. All right. Ryan, anything else before we jump into the next top set of topics? Yeah, let me just, uh, <clears throat> nothing else. I, I would like to talk about the next topics real quick. Um, so oh, hold start. up. So um, <clears throat> the next, there's going to be a new series of topics coming out, mainly around Nginx. We are going to talk about uh, big IP logging, one of the favorite subjects of everyone, I, I'm sure. Uh, there's a lot of different logging options. Sometimes it be a little confusing, so we're going to kind of demystify that. Uh, but that's going to kick off the Nginx uh, series. And uh, the Nginx series, we're going to start off with, you know, what, you know, what is Nginx, then go into API management, uh, then go into uh, something called Nginx App Protect, which is a new WAF offering for us, uh, for Nginx. And then uh, we are going to go into Nginx, uh, you know, managing your Nginx uh, instances with Nginx controller. And then lastly, we're going to do something a little different here. We're going to offer a lab, so that's going to actually be uh, on 1028, and that's going to be from 1 to 3 p.m. There's going to be a, a discussion around Kubernetes, and then we have a, a, a lab <clears throat> where you guys will all, everyone that registers will be able to give you a hands-on lab for free provided by us. It'll be a cloud-based lab. All you need is a, uh, a web browser to get that and register, and we'll, we'll get you into the lab, and, and it'll be you know, roughly about an hour and a half of lab, give or take. <clears throat> And that's, um, and then resources here, yeah. Yep. Uh, let's talk about this. Oh, no, no, I'll, I'll take it back, Ryan. So um, what I'm gonna show you is this CloudBox link and also this GitHub uh, repo where it has all of the things that I've been working on in, in between calls. And then also there's uh, documentation to all of our APIs and then also to AS3 if you're not, if you're not familiar with running AS3. All right, so let's get into how to build a policy and get into the nuts and bolts. All right, so let me stop sharing. That way I can share my screen. While he's pulling that up, there was a question around uh, Postman and something Jason will show. It's a free tool we've talked about in previous webinars. It is a, like I said, a free tool. There is a, a paid version of it. But for everything that you need to, or you would do with a big IP, is is it's free. The free version will work, uh, which yeah. is this is Postman here. If you haven't seen it before, it's a very well written and very. You know, a lot of people end up using it for to interact with REST API and then and also our uh, declarative API. So you see a lot of vendors besides just F5 using this. So it's if you haven't gotten familiar with it and you're interested in automation, I highly recommend you jumping into it and take a look at it. Uh, you you know it's useful for other products besides F5s. All right. All right, so let's get going here. All right, so before I get into the actual request, what I wanna point out is that any of, the, any of the, the Postman collections that I'm going to show you are available on GitHub today underneath the, the Dev Central repos. There's actually a repo called Access Solutions. And in each of these folders, there is a very, there are, there are various solutions to detail how a config might look. And if you go to cloudbox.f5.com and you scroll all the way to the bottom, the same place if you've ever done an agility lab before where we send you to, you're gonna see there's an F5 access and solutions link. What this does is this takes you through various configurations for Postman collections on how I've been building things. And I'm trying, I'm 
I'm literally building them as I'm going and putting them up there. So probably every week or two, you're going to see a new collection show up for a different solution. Like right now, I'm working on one for API protection, right? Uh, but you can see there's various collections up here that kind of walk you through how the config looks, things like that. So like if you want to make us a SAML SP and you want to see the policy, I can go to the policy and you can see here is the configuration that the automation builds, right? And the other piece to that is I need to hide there. The meeting controls are in front of my tabs. I couldn't click it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, you'll notice in each of the repos, if I go to like solution two, you'll see there's a Postman collection here. And then here's the collection that I use to create all of those objects. And here's these collection that deletes all of those objects. So feel free to uh, pull them down, to, uh, play with them. Let me know what works, what doesn't. If something doesn't work, or if you have an idea for, for a solution that you haven't seen or want to see me build, uh, I'm not a replacement for professional services, but I'm more than willing to take it as an idea and just throw it up here. And I'm more than willing to, to take a look at it as a way of building it through automation. Hey, right? Jason, so then uh, clicking on one of those JSON files will give them an idea of what it looks like and yeah. show that later on. But uh, yep. guys, the reason I bring this up is you can click on these and you don't necessarily need to even start with Postman. You can go in here and start taking a look to give you an idea of what uh, the JSON file looks like. And it's, you know, I think you take a look at it, you can get a fairly good idea of what it's trying to do. Yep. Yep. Yeah, definitely. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and pull up one that just builds a blank policy, right? Not, not building virtual servers, not doing any other objects. I'm just going to show you how to build a blank policy in those nuts and bolts, right? So if I go into this, right, we, we have the concept of a per session policy and a per request policy. This collection is up on, on here, up on GitHub, right? Oh, come here. There underneath the templates. So it's right there. This is the exact collection that I'm working with and I'm showing everybody, right? So it's enough to get you started. And then once you have the framework, what you would do is I have another template that I call library. <laughs> and what I've been doing is building collections or folders around all of the various APM objects. So if you remember how I talked about, oh, you need a customization group, an agent, and a policy item, rather than you trying to figure out what those various endpoints are and how to put them together, I've grouped them all together in this folder. So if you wanna build an LDAP server, this creates the node, this creates the pool, this creates the AD AAA object, right? Or when you build the policy, if I go into the per session policy, here are the individual policy items, like I mentioned, and their associated agents. That way, all of the requests are together so that you can understand how to build these things from scratch, right? And obviously, those various collections that I showed you that have solutions already built, they're good ways to get started from a building block. You can kind of take it and reverse engineer what I've done and kind of figure it out, figure out how to make it work for your specific use case. All right, so let's get going. So if you take a policy, right, and you remember I mentioned that idea of a transaction, right? When you want to build a policy, you send a post to the transaction endpoint. And you click send, and what it's going to do is it's going to return this thing called a transaction ID, right? Now, because I'm using Postman, what I'm doing is I'm taking that transaction ID and I'm saving it as a variable. Now, the reason I do that is that that transaction ID needs to be in all of the requests that I'm going to send regarding re related to building this policy that I want to build. So if you look in my headers, what you'll see is I'm passing this header here and it contains a variable called the transaction ID, right? So when I, what I do is when I click send, what you're going to see is you can see there is a command order uh, response. What this means is that, okay, this is the very first request that I'm going to process related to building this policy, right? And then when I click, click this one, I'm going to see a two right? 
and so on and so forth, right? And, and what I'm doing is I'm iterating through this until all of my requests are done. And I'm gonna go back and explain all those requests. I just want you to kind of see. All right, I'm just iterating through this. Because normally what I would do is I would just run the whole collection, then build it and see that it's done, right? Click send, right? There's nine, 10, 11, right? 12, <clears throat> click 13. And then, okay, I'm finally done. I'm now on my last transaction. This is what it took me to build this policy from scratch, right? And then I'm gonna commit this transaction. And as long as the demo gods cooperate with me, it's going to work. <laughs> And what you'll see here is you get a completed. That means it built the policy. If you get anything else here, it's going to spit back an error about, hey, you missed a reference. You're missing this. You're, there's something wrong within that policy that you created. And it will basically not build anything because it's an all or nothing approach. So either you're going to build this entire policy and all these objects, or you're not going to build any of it. All right? And then last but not least, outside of the transaction, I want to apply the policy. That way I don't end up with that little nifty little icon in the top left-hand corner that says apply policy, right? And then I click send, and then my policy is now applied. So if I go back to my GUI, right? I go over here, click log, and I log in. If I can even type the word password. All right, there's my policy and it is blank because there's not, <clears throat> that's all that policy was, right? Not all that useful, right? For, oh, well, it gives me a good policy, but it doesn't give me the framework. What I'm just trying to show you is, here's the building blocks to get started, right? So. Hey, Jason, let me, uh, yeah. I have a couple of questions here, and I have one that's pretty timely on this. Um, sure. <clears throat> since there are multiple post calls to find, how does it show failure if one of those were to fail? And then the next part of that question, then are they codependent and stop executing once one fails? No, they, they are not codependent because the big IP, here, you, you want to see it? Let's do this. <laughs> I don't mind showing it, right? So what I'm going to do, right, I'm just going to change the name of my policy here, right? This, this way that just builds it, right? Because this is where I define my, what the name of my policy is going to build, right? So I'm going to build it. And then let's go in here and break something like the deny, right? Let's go in here and change this. I'm going to change the name of the policy to a one, right? I'm going to save that and then run the transaction again, right? So click this. because there's nothing like showing it real time, right? What you're gonna see is it's gonna spit back those transaction IDs, right? It's saying three, four, right? It's going through and what it's doing is it's just accepting them, it's holding them. The big IP isn't actually processing. Them. So if there's actually something wrong in the linkage, right? Say an object is missing, like right now, my policy says it should go to just deny ending. It doesn't say it should go to, well, hold on. We'll get to it here, right? It says it, go, it should go to deny, not deny one, right? You're going to notice it took it because it actually hasn't processed it yet. Now, if you get something other than a 200, that means that your JSON payload was incorrect or something like that. But from, hey, did you build the policy holistically correct? you actually won't find that out until you commit the transaction. And that's what I'm gonna show you. So click this, click this, click this, and then we commit. And what we're gonna see, see, it said, hey, I can't find, well, uh, uh, it's cause this one already exists. Uh, oh, that's because this object is incorrect that everything else failed. And so now I have to go back through and see where my breakage was because this links back to this, right? Which then it's saying, hey, this is wrong. So you need to come back and work your way back up, right? 
So you can kind of see that it took the transaction, but it didn't tell me until I committed it that was something that was incorrect. Make sense? If I put that back, right? Because you can see here, this deny references this object, right? And it's saying, hey, you, there's something wrong in your linkage, right? So back to this. Um, if you remember, customization groups really just define whether it is modern or standard. And in this case, you can see here, I variableized it. I did this just so that I could easily switch back and forth between modern or standard, but you can obviously put, make this work for your environment however you need, right? And then what you do is you build the various customization groups. By default, you need all of these, right? These are the base things that you need to just get started to build an APM policy, right? You need all of these various customization groups, right? So you build the customization groups, then you build the agent, right? And in an allow ending, an allow ending doesn't have a customization group. And the reason is, is because when you allow something, somebody through, you're allowing them directly to that resource, resource, right? So there's never going to be like an error page or anything ever show up on the allow. But if you take a look at the deny ending, you're going to see there is a customization group. Why? Because I need to define, well, what does that deny page look like to an end user when it doesn't, when that person gets denied, right? Then policy items, right? Policy items reference agents, right? So if I take a look here, a policy item, right? This is the allow icon, right? I'm defining the colors, right? For my endpoints, for my terminals, what the caption is, what are the settings that I would see in VPE when I look at, right? And then what is my agent, right? Since this is an allow, allows are always at the end. It doesn't have a rule associated with it, right? Because it's an internal, right? All it does is say, go to this agent, right? Whereas a deny, same thing. It's just an internal. It doesn't have a rule set. But if you take a look at the start policy item, this is where we start getting into rule sets, right? Because these are building our branch rules because start needs to link to something, right? Because when I open up a blank policy, I always see start and I see deny, right? That's what this is doing. The start icon and its rule says go to the deny. So I'm building the linkages between those various objects. Make sense so far? All right, then once you have your various policy items defined, define, what you do is you just go into the policy and you list all of the items that you're going to make part of this policy. So since this is a blank policy, I've only got three items. I've got a start, I've got a deny, and I've got an allow it, nothing else, right? But if I start adding logon pages and AD auth and on-demand cert auth, each of those policy items I need to define here and just add them in. Then once they're done, I go to my profile and you can see in my profile, this is just all of the typical settings. Like I said that you would earlier that you would, when you click on it, what are all the timers? What is the language? Those kinds of things. What is my SSO profile? If I have one, those kinds of things are in here. And this is where it just links back to the customization groups, right? Because I need to know, is this going to use modern or uh, standard from a, a look and feel perspective? Then you commit the transaction and you just do a put back to the transaction endpoint and you declare what the transaction ID is. And then it runs through that transaction. That's the basic framework for building a blank policy, right? So if I take this a step further, I'm gonna pull up a couple policies and then show you one. So like if I open up that on-demand cert off in Cacta Kerberos policy, that's this guy right here. If I open this guy up, you're gonna see here's these same things, right? The various customization groups that I just showed you, right? But before I even start the transaction, I'm actually building those objects beforehand, meaning things that 
I'm going to reference inside of the policy, like the OCSP server, the AD AAA object, the things that you would normally build out of the outside of VPE, you build outside of the transaction. So I need to define my Kerberos SSO profile, I need to find my OCSP server, right? What my LDAP server is. That's what I'm doing here, right? And sorry, go ahead, Ryan, you got a question? Yeah, I would say some, some of the probably other people are wondering, is that a transaction when you create those other objects? No, they are, they are just purely, I control rest calls that you do outside of the transaction. They are, you can do them separately, right? So you can kind of see here, right, in my environment, I've got an AD server and I've only got one. So I build its node, I build its pool, and then I build the LDAP server object itself, right? Because that's all stuff in the GUI. If you're familiar with the GUI, you've always, you always build that stuff outside of VPE. VPE only references those objects that you built. So you can build those outside of the transaction. And in fact, I always do it outside of the transaction. Why? That way I can modify them outside of rebuilding the entire transaction because the policy itself might not change, but maybe I want to add a new server, right? Or delete a server from my AD server objects, right? I don't need that to be inside of the transaction. I want to be able to modify that independently, right? Makes sense. Yep. So I build my customization groups, right? It's the same order. Build my customization groups, define all of my agents, the settings for all of those items that I'm gonna have in the policy, like the allow ending, the deny ending. But you can see here, I've defined new agents, right? One's for OCSP, one for LDAP query, right? One for var assigning variables. And you can kind of see here, right, what I'm doing. I'm saying, okay, this OCSP server is going to reference the OCSP server that I built up here, right? Because this is its name. This virtual server name, this is a variable, by the way, in Postman, dash OCSP, OCSP dash servers. And if I go up to my create OCSP servers request, there's that object that I created, right? All I'm doing is referencing it inside of the policy. So I build all my, my agents, which are the settings. Remember, if I click on an object in VPE, it's all the settings regarding that, that object, right? For on-demand cert off, right? What OCSP, uh, am I going to prompt for certificate? An LDAP query, an LDAP query, right? What is the search filter? What is the domain? What are the servers that I'm going to talk to, right? What is my search DN? These are the things that you would define in the query itself. Right. And then like with UPN extract, right, this is the, the ob item that you would normally see in VPE that pull that in some cases people use an I rule. I prefer to use a VPE object. Right. And in this case, it pulls out that UPN out of the certificate and stores it as a session variable. Right. Then I define the domain right right here. This is my my AD domain. And then what I do is then I have to build all of those policy items because it's customization groups, agents, policy items, and then policies, get policy items go in the policy, right? So there's the allow ending, there's the deny ending. And now if I go to the start, if you remember that blank policy that I showed you, start went to deny, right? This is where you actually have to if, if you're not familiar with VPE, I would recommend drawing it out. What is the workflow that you want to do, right? Because you want to be able to define the linkages. You want to say, okay, the start, where is it going to go? It's going to go to my on-demand cert off <coughs> policy item, right? Now, once I do on-demand cert off, where is it going to go? On-demand cert off, I want to send to OCSP. And if you fail on-demand cert off, I want to send you to the deny branch. Right. This is why if you're not familiar with VPE, I can do this in my head because I can just see VPE in my head. If you're doing this through APIs, you really I would really recommend drawing this out because you want to understand what your branches are going to be. Right. Think about how the client is going to get access to, yes. to the resources. That's right. What is the workflow going to be like for a user? 
right, from an authentication and authorization control perspective, right? Then in OCSP, I'm assigning variables, right? And if, he, if I can't assign him variables, I send him down the fallback. Well, yeah, if he fails OCSP, OCSP I send him down the fallback, right? Then here I'm assigning variables, right? I'm doing, I'm pulling out that UPN, right? And then I'm going to go query actor directory for his SAM account name. Then if I go to LDAP query, you guys kind of see the idea, right? It's all, it's all branch rules, right? You're basically defining the policy and then in the rules, you say, what is the next object that I want to go to? And this is why it's so critical that it's done as a transaction because the last thing you want is to ha have a reference to an object that doesn't actually exist, right? Because you don't want to send it down to something that just is a black hole, right? So in this case, I'm sending it to the variable sign, then variable sign. If it changes, right, then I send them to an allow, right? That's the workflow. You just follow these rules. And then it's the same process. Put the pol put inside of the policy. You put all of the policy items, right? Every everything that you have as a policy item here should be listed here. So you can see there's ver the various variable signs, on demand cert off, and OCSP. Then you run the profile, and then you commit the transaction. And then it builds the policy. So like if I run this right now, it's going to run through and it's going to build, run my collection and it's going to build out that entire policy for me. <clears throat> and there it is, there's that policy. And you can, and so it, that's how policies are built from scratch in APM, right? You, you build, run a transaction, build customization groups, build agents, build policy items, define brand, the branch rules in the policy items, then build a policy, build a profile, and you're done. So. Yeah, it's a great way to standardize your configuration across, you know, maybe you've got a, a smart card requirement across many different virtual mm -hmm. This is a great way uh, to implement that, right? You've got a standard blueprint of how to do it, and now you've got a, a way, you know, you could use Postman or, or something else to yep. uh, propagate that across many different virtual servers. Now you know you have a standardized config across many different virtual servers. Or many well, different and that's, that's right, Ryan, right? So, like, if I take, like, Solution 3 here and I pull it in, right, this is just building out a basic SAML SP config, right? So if you wanted to build this, Right, this is a good cookie cutter template for just enabling federations on applications. So every time you new, build a new uh, app, if it doesn't support federation, right, you, your Jenkins pipeline could trigger this policy build to build this policy and define a new SAML SP, right, and make it all automated as part of your pipeline. Yep. And with that, Right, uh, Ryan. That's that's APM automation in a nutshell. So, Would you could you show them real quickly maybe how to import one of those collections? How easy it is, and and how you would get that you know, from GitHub. Oh sure. Yeah. So so it depend it depends on if you're a GitHub fanatic or not, right? So you can actually go out to GitHub, and if you want, you can just download the entire collection, right, and then download the entire collection and then open it up. But if you're like me, I just work directly in GitHub. So I pull down the collection and then once it's on my box, right, it'll show up as a folder in your, on your local machine, right? And so here's my access selections repo, right? This will allow you to keep up to date with my collections without having to manually download them because you can just pull my changes if you do it this way. Right. And then once you're in Postman, you'll just simply open up Postman, click import. 
go to file and upload and then find the collection that you want by going to the folder for whichever solution, right? So if you want the blank template policy, right? I can go here and I can then say, okay, I want my blank policy. Click that, click import and there. Now this is in my Postman collection or in my Postman. Now is a collection that I can now play with. Once you go, um, you have to change the environment variables. So yes. That he has the big IP management interface and you have to customize that IP yeah. address and uh, using a password for your environment. But other yeah. than that, it's that simple. Yeah, right, right. So like in my case, right, my, my, my collections right now, I just define what is my virtual server name going to be, which partition am I going to be in. Um, and then when I get into my data centers, what data centers allow me to do is define multiple big IPs, right? So I can iterate through these just by creating the loops, right? So if I wanted to create another or another data center, I could just easily add a whole new set of variables in here for data center three, data center four, and my and it will just loop through and build that policy on every one of my big IPs over and over and over and over again. Yeah, that's very cool stuff. Yeah. Very easy to get started with. You know, these are is a great way to to test this out, you know, download the uh the blank template collection and mm -hmm. you know, around your environment. Yeah. Let's see next we get another question here. Where? Uh here's a good question. Uh how do you do <laughs> HA in this method of deployment? How would you do HA? How would you deal okay. with HA and this method of, of deployment? So the way that, so most folks, right, if you're going to do automation, I might as well just deploy it to both boxes, but it really depends on how much automation you're doing. So here's what I mean. If your entire pipeline and all of your big IP configuration is built through automation, right, you, you you need to establish HA so that you can share session information from an APM per configuration perspective, but I could build the policies independently outside of syncing APM policies, or I could just build to big IP one and then go over to big IP one and say sync, right? Or do auto sync. It's, it's, it still follows the same rule set as if you were going to do manual, I guess is what I would say. Like, how do you sync today between your active and standby box? If you're doing auto sync, then you can just push it to one box and let it push over, right? Yeah, if not, you'll okay. be. Yeah, if not, you're going to, you're, pro you're probably going to want to push to both boxes. Yeah. Great question. Any other questions? With that, I appreciate it, Jason. Great job. This is a, a very interesting topic. We had uh, one of the uh, uh, attendees from a past webinar asked for this, and we uh, it was submitted through the survey, and we put it up. And if you guys have any other topics like this you would like to see, these are kind of niche topics or whatever, uh, or anything else, you please you know submit that through the survey or you know hit up your account team, let them know. Uh, we appreciate everyone mm -hmm. attending and uh, please fill out the survey and keep in mind that all these uh, recordings are up on the, the YouTube playlist that I uh, put in the chat. And um, we'll see everyone next week. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone, have a good day. <laughs>